This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you don't know who they are, <laughs> what? They make um, websites, in it. More at the end. Hello my young Padawans and welcome. We're going to be looking at Jedi Fallen Order in depth and we're going to be taking a chronological path through the game, discussing what becomes relevant when. Bracca's strength is competency, elevated into deep space through the Star Wars coat of paint. It's a good tutorial level. It looks good. It does the whole make you hate the villain thing by killing the friendly man. But dude, you've got a spicy glow stick and you're fighting the Empire in a decent combat system for the first time since The Force Unleashed 2, which came out a decade ago. It's worth considering that this game might be elevated immensely because of the way it makes some players feel. And I'm no diehard fan of Star Wars, but I gotta tell you, on Bogano, just after Cal joins up with Seer and Grease, it had that same effect on me too. You can watch your ship fly off when you choose a new destination, you can customise your lightsaber however you want. Oh my god, this is probably the most game ever made. The music is the reinforced steel beams holding this structure together. It feels so much like the movies, you don't even question you're playing a game. Even the humour, with the cute droid doing cute shit, a sense of wonder so essential to Disney, and even an element of supernatural mystery. The movies have never done that well. Respawn wants you to feel like this is an alien world with its own life and geometry to explore, but it also doesn't want you getting lost and frustrated, so the level design has a tough task here. It's never entirely clear where to go, but it's never so hard to find the right path that you're lost for more than a minute. Though, there's not really such a thing as a wrong path. There's always something to reward exploration. A cool collectible, a permanent stat boost, a lightsaber customization item, a poncho, or an entirely new area. Oh, and don't get me started on the combat. A mysterious master Jedi, Cordova, thinks Zepho's the place to be for information about how to protect Force-sensitive children from the Empire. So we'll head there and see what's what, and then I'll get started on the combat. Clearly, Respawn are big fans of FromSoft's work, or maybe EA are big fans of the cash dollar their games make. But either way, it's no secret that Jedi Fallen Order is Souls-like. You've got the typical interconnected level design dotted with bonfires, a loss of souls when you die, and a Sekiro-like combat system with a much higher impetus on defense than avoidance. What do you get when you take good combat and cross it with an amazing coat of paint? Good combat, surprise surprise. The animation on the lightsaber swings feels amazing. Enemies are excellently varied, their attacks are well telegraphed, and often create decently interesting scenarios. A flamethrower dude and a minigun dude at the same time gets you playing in a very different way to a blaster dude and a stick dude. The guard meter on humanoid enemies prevents overpowering Cal, but allows the lightsaber to feel like a weapon of immense power when it breaks through to the flesh. Your own ability to guard is balanced with your own guard meter, and you can't rely on it due to frequent unblockable attacks. Powerful force attacks are balanced with a force meter. That's what I got. There isn't a novel to write about Jedi's combat, because we've seen it before. It doesn't do a great deal of its own, but that doesn't mean what did feel fresh was insignificant. Firstly, there's an enjoyable dynamic in combat encounters involving ranged and melee enemies. You want to parry incoming blasters, but also deal with whatever's up in your grill. Having to monitor multiple threats, including the position of the blaster in the air, is an effective touch. I also like the management of soul loss on death. The try, try, try again mentality is enforced strongly without any brutal punishments, now that you only have to graze their health bar to get it all back. Before I start talking about Zepho itself, let me get two things out of the way. First, why can't I climb this? Second, why can't I climb this? It looks the exact same as every other climbable surface, and I'm losing health for falling respawn. This isn't what I expected when you said Fallen Order. Did the rest of the Jedi make the same mistake? You can't have inconsistencies like this and a Grand Master difficulty. Rant over. On Zepho, the training wheels come off. Many enemies are thrown at you regularly and in tandem. The types start varying too. You've got commanders, rocket troopers, and minigun troopers. 
They pose a good example of how combat becomes increasingly intertwined with movement as you approach one from a series of beams. For another, there's an ice slide to go down while you're taking fire. Though I do have to question how believable the most convenient ice slides in the galaxy showing up in Cal's path is. As the distance between bonfires grows, you start to respect the gravity of your situation, and that's nothing if not immersive. Of course, higher stakes also means kicking ass feels better than ever. Mechanics remain engaging, exploration remains rewarding, presentation is better than ever, difficulty feels well paced, and there's a good sense of mystery. For a fun example of how mechanics are expanded upon, let's check out this mountain. It's often that you see giant cracks that knock you up, sorry, off ledges in video games. Navigating them is much the same tense affair here, but they also do something a little extra. Your only force power at this point is freeze, so they hide a chest in the machine's path. You get a tiny window to freeze it and make it over. A short while later, you have to freeze it mid-thrust and use it as a platform. It truly is remarkable how they keep the mechanical escalation going. 20 minutes on, you're in a tomb. Now you have to be more careful than ever during movement thanks to these arse plants. You've even got an interwoven ball and wind mechanic throughout the entire dungeon that finishes with an actual puzzle. An actual puzzle. It's nothing remarkable, but it made me think, and that's more than I ever expected. I talk this up so much, and it's important too, because it's reflective of how I felt on Zepho. I thought it was amazing, and I want you to as well, so I can take your hope and rip it away from you. <laughs> If you haven't played this game, you've probably noticed something. If you have, and you're with me on this, you'll know the transition from WOW to somewhere above boredom is a lot smoother than I make it out to be. The problem is, unsurprisingly, the pace of escalation slows as the game goes on, so it can't keep distracting you from how fundamentally unoriginal Fallen Order really is. This game's a mix of just about everything. It combines Souls-like interconnected level design dotted by bonfires with Metroidvania-esque item usage in the same way as Darksiders 3, where you gain an item later in the game for use in areas earlier. It does puzzles like Darksiders, Zelda, and Tomb Raider with a couple key mechanics relative to the location in combination with items, which in this case is the Force. Combat is just like Sekiro with guard meters and a higher focus on defense, while force push and pull feel straight out of control. Movement's almost a carbon copy of Darksiders 2 with wall running, vine climbing and ledges, but there's also some Uncharted in there with the rope swinging. Even the mystery's been done before, an ancient alien race that mysteriously disappeared, boy. You can actually hear the same composition style when Fallen Order's doing its supernatural wonder as you could in Titanfall 2. If you're a fan of this genre, moreover, if you're a fan of games, you've probably played Jedi Fallen Order before. And I wish I didn't have to say that it's a weakness, but it is. It does nothing bar lightsabers particularly better than anything we've seen before, which can make the experience feel quite unremarkable, forgettable, disinteresting. When it's done playing all its best cards for the first time, it felt like I was going through the motions, boxes are getting ticked, but I'm not amazed. Speaking of forgettable, we're in the ice mines. Nothing interesting is done here. It's just more. Thankfully, it's short. Better, just a while later, it links into the very first locked door you saw on Zepho for some of that beautiful interconnected design. And behind it is a 1v1 boss fight with an ATST. It's done surprisingly believably. The lasers are fairly easy to dodge for a force user, which is why most of its arsenal is dedicated to getting you to piss off. Landmines and stun grenades are deployed around its feet. A cool moveset, certainly. But I shouldn't be overzealous with the praise. There's very little for Cal to do here, except choose between spamming dodge or blocking the lasers. Blocking gives a shot at parrying, so that's the high risk, high reward strategy. But after that choice, what more is there to this fight? You get in for strikes, then you roll away, avoid attacks for a bit, rinse, repeat. It's really quite repetitive. But our next destination should be a happy sight for fans. Kashyyyk. Kashyyyk sets the familiar formula in stone, interconnected level design, shortcuts with escalating combat, movement and puzzle encounters. But to no one's surprise, the cracks are starting to show themselves. 
We've seen the inconsistent rules of climbing on Zepho, but what about this zinger? You got a spinning platform, and you want to get from where you are to one of the sides. My first idea was to freeze it diagonally, so I'd just barely have the distance to get across, and I did. Except I didn't, because the game decided that Cal can't climb anymore. What is this, hydrofluoric acid? I don't buy it. My second idea was to freeze it, hop on, allow it to speed back up, and then freeze it again at the right moment. But no, that doesn't work either. Because Cal just ragdolls like someone shot a mouse up his ass. Sure, I'd probably want to sit down at this speed, but are you trying to tell me that this roundabout is like trying to surf on a fighter jet? Come on. The real solution is just turning it off and on again from the other side and then using the pipes to go around. But there shouldn't have been any solution, because this should have been cut. There's no doubt that plenty of people will have had no trouble, and I'll have had no trouble with areas plenty of people had. But it seems that for everyone, moments like this are pervasive. Only moments later, I lost a fight with a security droid because it glitched me into a corner and I couldn't move. Which brings me on to a question, one I've asked myself playing this game and so many before. Why souls? Let's talk about Dark Souls. I'm sure you guys have never heard those words from a games critic before, so I should be treading new ground here. But this, unironically. Because I want to talk about the soul of Dark Souls. Dark Souls married its gameplay and themes perfectly. You fight through a dead, post-apocalyptic world on the verge of slipping out of the light forever. To exist only as a graveyard forevermore in each of the three titles. Everything that was once great is atrophied, starved of soul. And in the midst of it, you. A decrepit, lone husk. But within, within is the power to stand up against all of it. To take the devastating defeats and just keep coming back. That's what made Dark Souls so thematically powerful, to me, and why a good number of people have had it speak deeply to their depression. Because it's the most striking portrayal of willpower I have ever seen in games. Just keep fighting, never give in. It's expressed both in the lore and in the game. I don't know if Demon Souls has the same power to people, but my point is, everything about the soul's structure enhanced the experience. It was like a trial. Maybe less so in FromSoft's later titles, but I can at least speak for Bloodborne that its lore fit the structure beautifully. You're alone because you're going out on the night of the hunt, everyone else has succumbed to the beast curse or is hiding away. And the intense difficulty works because you're meant to be in a literal nightmare, up against Lovecraftian forces. For another example, in FromSoft's work, when enemies respawn, it's always up to some supernatural cause like time dilation, or nightmares, or the undead curse. Now, the Souls-like genre is a big deal, and FromSoft sure aren't the only players. But so many of those so-called clones seem only to use the structure or aspects of it because it's popular. Ironically, they've forgotten that it worked so well there because of its soul. Makes sense now that I've never felt as compelled by the formula in clones as I have in the originals. Which sucks, to be sure. But it's outright bad when it's carrying over Souls conventions to no positive effect. We'll start small. Enemies respawning and finding themselves in the exact same circumstances feels like Groundhog Day. There's no supernatural element to help suspend your disbelief. Getting worse, just like in Control, spawning you at a bonfire instead of at the boss serves zero point whatsoever. You can't gain anything from killing enemies. You're just dodging past them, and if you get grazed on the way there, the frustration is immeasurable, because now you're going to start at a huge disadvantage. It doesn't encourage me to try, try, try again, it encourages me to alt, alt, alt F4. It's not even just boss runs, it's extensive runs to get back to tough combat encounters. Fighting enemies on the way is fine, that's gameplay you're meant to master, but what about when you're spending what feels like an entire minute doing this stupid-ass uncharted climbing section? This isn't proving my mastery respawn, it's not even practice. It's a bigger pain in the ass than Johnny Sins. I played on Grandmaster, so I've got plenty to say about the higher difficulties of this game. But for now, I want to address the difficulty in general. There are a lot of people complaining that this game is too hard, and as usual, a lot of that is failing to take personal responsibility. But I sympathise with those who wonder what the point was. I played on Grandmaster with two stims, and even I don't understand the point. You could have had a brutal difficulty option without the Souls framework. Selecting story mode isn't going to remove it. It's not going to take away boss runs or any of the innately challenging parts of Souls. Was it a good fit for Star Wars? Well, art doesn't have to be made to appeal to the most people, so I'm watching my argument here. But I can't help thinking this game could have done everything it does now better if it didn't want to be Souls-like. Now, we've got a tomb to raid on Zepho, so let's come back to that argument in a bit. 
There's no fast travel in Jedi, smart, because it raises your chances of revisiting old areas. They might have a little more to them when you come back with new abilities, and it also brings some Dark Souls 1 to the table, where you're expected to use a little meta-scale navigation to find your way. The hollow map is perfectly legible, so there's nothing fiddly to crafting a route. Might want to check out an old area, you might prioritise speed, you might want to reduce encounters. It's a nice variation in the gameplay loop. On that note, the pace of escalation takes a significant hit on your second visit. Almost nothing new is done with movement unless you count being able to go up a zipline, which I don't because it isn't a mechanic. It's just a means to access new areas, no different than an access key. Meanwhile, combat has only rationed these flying drones to parry. And honestly, though the Star Destroyer might be nice to look at, the primarily Imperial and otherwise grey environments don't do much for the eye. It's a fairly dull affair, but thankfully before the tomb we're treated to the very first lightsaber boss fight. It's been possibly, uh, yeah, forever since I last had a decent lightsaber battle in a video game. So this is a rush. The second sister's movements are a joy just to look at. Everything's telegraphed well. It's a great moveset, nothing less, plenty more, but only because it's lightsabers. This is a standard boss fight, you've played it before. Now let's have a look at this tomb. Where the first dealt with wind, this deals with magnets, some of which contain torches which you need to burn bramble. This makes a lot of sense, because as we know, lightsabers are pretty terrible at cutting things and aren't that hot at all. Often when you enter a giant room in these games, you're expecting a decently sized puzzle, right? You'd sure get one in Darksiders or Zelda, but in Jedi, when you enter a giant room with all these moving parts, the level design often solves the puzzle for you. I felt this in the first tomb as well, that despite how many offshoots and spaces there were, as long as I followed the correct route, everything would simply fall into place, and until the very last room, it did. Here for example, you enter a big old chamber with a big old magnet platform thing. Looks complicated, but as long as you follow the route, there's pretty much only one thing you can do at any given time. You go along the only way you can go, you press the button and the correct path opens. It's not really a puzzle then, it's just a bit of variation in the level design. This is true until the very last wall where you have to use force freeze, but that's no more interesting than stuff we were doing five hours ago. Fast forward a minute, and Cal's got Force Pull, with which you can start using the fire magnets to burn Bramble. In the central chamber, there's a ball held in a glass container. The game has been drawing attention to that for a while, so it seems clear we're going to have to get it out. There's a flammable part of the chain, so target acquired. All we're going to need now is some fire. Easy done. Next, we got to get it to the Bramble, and this is where the fun begins. The rain you previously assumed was set dressing proves capable of putting out the flame, so you realise that the rainfall creates pathways. Very cool. It seems clear you'll have to get it across this small gap. So you drop it, freeze it in midair, and then collect it from the other side. But you might first assume that you could easily hop this gap, and it's really a contrivance that you can't. A good puzzle even so. From there you free the ball and your time in the tomb is done. One interesting puzzle in an entire tomb is rather disappointing, especially since this now brings the puzzle count up to a grand total of two. But nonetheless, that's two more than nothing. Game's better with them than without them. Unlike the first trip to Zepho, this one does end with a bang. Quite literally, you get your ass kicked by a random bounty hunter and wake up behind bars. Guess they watched Gotham and thought you were going to commit incel violence. Man, this game really doesn't have an original bone in its body. But I can't argue with the variation. Turns out the whole thing's a reality TV show and the finale is an arena. Sounds like fun. It's three rounds into a decent boss, and that's about it. Which is just the thing with Fallen Order's bosses, there's really not much to say. You want to know that their attacks are well telegraphed, or that you aren't forced to depend on a single viable strategy? Well, you're not. Their moveset fits the context of their character, they look good, they're fair for the most part, they're good enemies, and that's just it. These fights do absolutely nothing different, and absolutely nothing remarkably well. They're not creative enough to feel like Zelda-esque bosses, no test of recently acquired abilities, no incorporation of mechanics such as wind or magnets, but they're also not bold enough to feel like Souls-esque bosses. Outside of maybe one exception, there's no grandeur, no huge scale, no badass music, no incredible arenas. Only three bosses have a second phase and that's just a tougher moveset, instead of something interesting like doubling up or changing the setting. At least the lightsaber bosses stand out. They've got lightsabers, and that's always going to be more compelling than Jetpack John or a diabetic sea cucumber. Having given Jetpack John's family enough time to mourn, I say it's high time we paid a visit to Dathomir. 
Darth Maul's homeworld is available the moment you're let off the hook. You can head here before you even hit Zepho. And frankly, that's one of my favourite things about this game. Dathom is sold as a challenge, particularly early game, and it is. The mere option of putting yourself to the test is compelling to me, as a way of proving mastery, and doubly so for repeat playthroughs. I love the idea that on a second run, Cal's journey might feel completely different based on the sequence of planets he visits. But proving mastery is not going to be enough for most players. They're going to need an extrinsic motivation, a material benefit, in the same way as heading somewhere early in Dark Souls for an ember or a weapon. Well, about two areas into Dathomir, you get it. The double lightsaber. Oh, baby. We'll take that for a spin in just a second. I don't want to gloss over Dathomir's Knight Brothers. Compared to the Empire, they're tougher in every way. But that's just because they're the Empire with a few new tricks. It's just stupid that the Knight Brother archers fire easily deflectable blaster bolts in the exact same way as stormtroopers, despite being from completely different races, planets, and cultures. It's a bow, for God's sake, are you kidding me? The warriors are just angrier scout troopers, so the same dynamic exists in combat where you want to deal with the ranged enemies first. There's almost no functional difference between this lot and the others you fought before. It's jarring, and it's a shame. Thankfully, our second visit to Kashyyyk is a good place to demonstrate the newfound capabilities of the lightsaber. One on one, the double blade is utterly outmatched, the DPS is weak. But of course, it can hit more than one target at the same time. So, the dynamic becomes clear. If there are enemies close together, use double. If not, use single. But there's more to it than that. Preparation might be more complicated than you think. There's an attack you can buy very early that allows you to switch blades while dealing damage, much like Bloodborne. The devs value this ability so much that it's mapped to a hold of X. Of course, it's higher risk, but the high damage switch attack is the high reward. We also have to consider deflection capability. Single blade can parry a blaster bolt, right? But if you parry a blaster bolt with a double blade, all subsequent bolts are also sent back, as long as there isn't too great a delay between hits. So, in the right situation, and with a bit of good timing, you can walk up to a group of stormtroopers and drop them like flies. You can greatly enhance your play by using the right blade at the right time. It's a hearty helping of depth added onto an already deep combat system. They've outdone themselves with this. I adored learning all these new systems so far into the game. Unlike Zepho, they've managed to vary the terrain like night and day despite being set on the same planet. You're taken through an especially jungle-like area known as the Shadowlands. In its heart, you have to be wary of jaw plants that you can only step on for a second before they snap, and poisonous red flowers that seek your position. It can get quite tense with a lot of them around. Kinda felt like Terraria's jungle, which is about as high a praise I can give. Oh wait, did I say something? Because the next area has trampoline plants, which reminds me of Wind Waker, so we've gotten as high as we're gonna get. Those were Michael Jackson's last words, I imagine. Fun fact, the developers cite Wind Waker as an inspiration for this game. That puts a smile on my face. The variation is at an all-time high, but it just gets better. All that water you've been swimming through? Well, now with a rebreather from Tarful, you can swim within it and explore the depths. In contrast to recent events, the game is now doing a fantastic job of preventing things feeling stale. But there is one thing I take issue with. There's not been much to say about the story so far, but since we first arrived on Kashyyyk, we've had the singular objective of meeting Tarful, a Wookiee commander who could supposedly help us uncover a Zepho artifact. And what is our grand meeting with him like? It's not even a cutscene, he just meows that we've got to reach the top of the origin tree. Right, well, that was the most anticlimactic meeting I've ever had. Why didn't the writers just have the origin tree as your destination to begin with? A name like that elicits far more intrigue and anticipation than a single Wookiee goon. It just doesn't add up to me. Moving on, there's a big old sliding set piece, but Uncharted, though it may desperately want to be, this is not. Let's not even get bogged down with how dumb it is that every planet is littered with convenient slides for Cal to inexplicably roller skate through. The best set pieces feel like they're not just a bunch of scripted explosions and your input is actually achieving something. This doesn't, you're just sliding down some mud and doing the same bog standard movement challenges you've done since Braca. But worse, it's bugged to hell. Momentum decides not to exist on some corners, and vines were performing questionably too. Thankfully though, a big white birdie shows up to save Cal from the ninth sister, and you from this bullshit. Climbing up the pleasantly wood-themed origin tree nets us the final force ability, which I must admit felt a tad out of place. All we were doing was bouncing around on some trampolines and then we were suddenly given the Jedi flip, which by the way is a fancy way of saying double jump. Not particularly dramatic, unlike the previous abilities which punctuated the halfway point in a tomb, similar to items in a Zelda dungeon. Predictably you end up finding the nice birdie, predictably it's injured, predictably you heal it, and then predictably take it for a spin in this 7th gen looking ass cutscene. Music is second to none, but this is painfully cliché. 
It just doesn't have the same effect when you've been through this routine 350,000 times. Since we never saw her die outright, the Ninth Sister rocks up in the most obvious setup known to man. She's a good fight, but disappointingly low-tier waifu material. What's been interesting about visiting Kashyyyk again also carries over to Dathomir. Ninth Sister Merin takes offense to your demonic force magic and sets loose a horde of zombies. Zombies. Yes. In Star Wars. Perfect for the double saber and a refreshing change of enemies, but I must admit, this game is starting to feel remarkably like a fantasy rather than a sci-fi, and a derivative one at that, as if all the stuff people like in fiction was just thrown into a pot and seasoned with a Star Wars paint job. You got mages, you got magic, you got zombies, the big ass tree, the big ass bird, the guy from New York who calls everyone kid, it's the whole shebang. It's every cliche ever done. And I think that's just the story the writers wanted to tell. But is it really a coincidence that the gameplay feels the exact same way? A mishmash of what's popular? Despite the fact that Respawn didn't do what EA originally wanted them to, it seems very likely that they had a hand to play in the technical state of this game. Sometimes it's enemies jumping like dumbasses, no big deal. Sometimes it's the camera glitching through the environment, also not a big deal. But other times it's worse. Much worse. Sometimes enemies will be sent into the stratosphere, and then land who knows where, maybe getting in a cheap hit. Sometimes an enemy will glitch you into a corner that you physically cannot escape, almost always resulting in a cheap death, or you might get stuck in the environment otherwise. I wouldn't give a toss, frankly, if there wasn't a Grand Master difficulty, but there is. This game wants to present itself as that skill-based gauntlet. It is Souls-like, but I can't count the number of times I've taken permanent damage to a whole lot of bullshit. Bugs aren't the only problem, inconsistencies make it twice as bad. I've talked about some before, but let's address the one in Dathomir. You've been taught that you're immune to fall damage, right? So why can't I jump down here? I can jump down the next, almost equally far drop just fine, but not this one. Sure, it looks like that might be skipping, but that's not good enough. You can't arbitrarily put kill zones in areas a player might assume they could get to, thanks to lessons you've taught them. Or maybe you can. You probably could, but failing the platforming in this game comes with a good chunk of health loss, and that's just not acceptable when every mistake counts. Brings me back to the pervading question. Why is this game Souls-like? What does it gain from going down this route? I'm seeing no answers. Dathomir is the perfect place to make this point, because I don't believe it was playtested. Following a later fight with a big ass beast thing, there's a short and pointless box puzzle that requires you to pull over a box and use its height to grab onto a ledge. After that, it's an archer's gauntlet, where all those bugs and inconsistencies I just covered show their face. If you respawn, you have to move the box all over again. That's not punishment, that's contempt. You could say that there's not much difference between bonfires and checkpoints, but bonfires absolutely encourage bad placement, because they're going for the hardcore sense of a great trial between them. In the section right after, there's a beast glitching out in the corner, and then I'm clipping through the floor. I know Dark Souls 3 pulled this trick once, but the whole surprise routine this game does with an enemy hidden behind a corner is cheap the first time, insufferable the tenth. The plunging attack is too inconsistent, and worst of all, when an enemy glows gold, you can't see the red glow to indicate an unblockable attack. That also applies to bosses, and I'll tell you what, I haven't had a heated game a moment in years, but that pulled it off. Just to avoid the impact wounds from being pounded with bullshit the entire game, I truly think the game is better on Master. Glad that I mentioned bosses, cause wow! A big open room completely flat and surrounded by walls? Well, bugger me if this isn't a boss fight. Gorgora is a strong fight, but if you fought a bird before, you fought this. It tries to smack you, but it gets stuck, so that's your opportunity. Sometimes it gets angry and uses wind as a ranged attack, or swoops across the arena. That's really all there is to it. It keeps you on your toes, you can't exploit. There's nothing to complain about here, unless you count the fact that other devs could probably claim copyright. The bird leaves with a little health left on the bar, so maybe that's the third puzzle. You've got to decide whether or not it's gonna come back. This is some mastermind level shit right here. So yeah, it comes back, and this is just embarrassing. You're meant to climb away from the bird, but it's not as simple as that. You're allowed to go near its claws, but not its beak. Who knows why? And those rocks you see falling down? Well, in another game, they'll hit you, so you should get out of the way. But it's actually getting out of the way that'll kill you, because the bird will catch up. In reality, none of the rocks can hit you, which you might have known if you had a vertical perspective, but you don't. Once you get to the top, there's a free fall section, because Cal needs to use the bird to break his fall. Logically, you have to press L2, same for grabbing onto anything else. But unlike literally every other climbable surface, if L2 is held before the prompt shows up, it just won't register. This is some crusty-ass QTE tacked onto an average boss. It seems quite clear that parts of this game were just rushed, and others were given the utmost attention. Bogano? Is it Bogano? Bogano? I don't know. It's one of those. 
Braca and early Zepho, these areas are next to perfection, but the bugs go on and on throughout Dathomir, all the way up until the third tomb. This one's different, it's playing with your head forcing you to relive Order 66 in what seems like evidence of my point. This section is brilliant, the music is so fantastically tragic and you're so attached to Thanos as a father figure that the emotional impact is unmatched. Should be so, Order 66 kinda sucked ass. There's not a bug in sight. Unfortunately, Cal breaks his lightsaber because he's a fucking idiot and then the zombies put you in grave danger. So you gotta dash your ass off world. There's only one place to be when a Jedi is in need of a lightsaber. Endor. No. Ilum. Easy mistake, they're both whiter than Jimmy Carr's teeth. Ilum looks absolutely incredible. The quality of the atmosphere cannot be understated here. Through the excellent composition and the brilliant graphics indoors, it's truly a breathtaking spectacle. With no lightsaber, it had to be. All it's got is movement and some light puzzle dressing and firing a light through a crystal to melt some ice. It works. Ilum feels like a sacred place. Though it's not difficult, traversing it feels like a trial. And due to Cal's mental state from having relived Order 66, it feels absolutely appropriate that he would break down upon losing the only kyber crystal to be found. In BD-1's Lost Memories, he finds wisdom and hope enough to stand back up and craft his saber. It felt powerful, not contrived, albeit cliche. And exciting too because you get to choose any colour you please. As we know, lightsaber colour determines your views on women, so it's great that there's such a wide range of perspectives. But it's not just the colour. You get yet another lightsaber type, the split saber. Sadly, it is only reserved for specific attacks, it's not a state like the double saber. But it does mark a huge increase in power. The split saber is incredibly strong, requiring only as much force as any other ability, but doing extreme damage to even multiple targets in range. Good thing then that the game puts you up against as many scout troopers as the engine can handle for you to have a little power trip. I love this whole part of the game, but it only builds on a concern I had well before the split saber was introduced. And that's force abilities, force abilities everywhere, but not a drop to use. You have the overhead strike and a follow up, lightsaber throw, force pull, force push, force freeze, air repulse, and a heavy attack and a hula hoop for the double saber, all of which consume the exact same limited force bar. That does not leave room to experiment. I threw my lightsaber maybe once or twice in the entire game. I never used freeze after the halfway point because I would only use my force on abilities I was certain would be worth it. It hurts the power fantasy. A lot. You only have enough force to start mucking about very late into the game. Which brings me back to the question, yet again, why Souls? The Souls genre has done magic, it's had weapon arts and special attacks like in Sekiro. But the goal was never to give you a power trip, no one wanted that. From Star Wars though, Star Wars is a different beast. And like I said, the fusion isn't wrong, because that implies you can only make art that appeals to the most people. But I will say that I had to try hard to feel like a Jedi, and that sucked. Having escaped Ilum and Cal having learned to let go of his guilt for not saving his master during Order 66, we can head back to Dathomir and access the final Zepho tomb. Turns out there isn't actually a tomb. You get what you're looking for almost immediately. So yeah, that leaves the total at two. Two puzzles. It's great. Anyway, there are two other things of note on Dathomir. Those are Taran Malikos and Night Sister Marin. Malikos is a Jedi turned dark side user. He promised Marin revenge for the deaths of their sisters in return for letting him use their magic, hence their alliance. But Marin is untrusting, so she allows him to fight Cal unaided. What a boss fight, it's easily my favourite of the lot. Why? Because it looks good. It's got that grandeur a boss fight should. The arena, the surroundings, it's a movie worthy duel. What more could you want? A less annoying boss run, that's what you could want. Squeezing through this arse crack for about 30 combined minutes is time I'll never get back. As for Marin, she chooses to join Cal's bro team, and we'll go over her character soon. What I'd like to bring up now is that she's my new waifu. Why aren't more girls tattooed Russian witches these days? The circle completes itself as we journey back to Bogogano. Marin raises a very valid point. Are we sure finding this holocron with all the names of the four sensitive children in the galaxy is a good thing? Won't we be condemning them to the same fate? Having let the Astrium do its work, Cal has a vision that shines some light. He finds the children, trains them up, and one by one, the Empire hunts them down, slaughtering them. Just like what happened to Seer's Padawans. Speak of the devil. The second sister fight barely lasts the blink of an eye, before Cal grabs her lightsaber and her past is revealed. You watch from her perspective as she's captured, tortured, and made to don her second sister uniform in front of Seer. The rage resulting beckons the dark side from Seer, that's why she cut herself off from the Force. What stands out among endless fantasy cliches is the characters of the story. Throughout the entire game, the presentation of their emotion is next to perfect, with excellent acting and these brilliant mindfuck sequences. You watch your Padawans die in this abyssal place, you see Cal turn to the dark side. 
It's reflective of his own fear, show don't tell taken as literally as it gets. They're written just as well. I could see the makings of a Mass Effect cast here. Seer's guilt is believable, she sold out her Padawan under Imperial torture and let in the dark side when they used Triller against her. She failed, she made mistakes, and her actor sells all of that guilt under the skin masterfully. Through that, you can also understand Trilla's perspective. Her master having betrayed her, and also under torture, she fell entirely to the darkness. Nothing here is groundbreaking, but it's something, and it works. Something, however, isn't really enough for a protagonist. Kel is a very typical Star Wars hero archetype. A virtuous young paragon. And there's very little variance from that. There's very little depth. What there is is good, Order 66 and the weight of his failure was very interesting to see play out, but it's much too late in the story. I wanted to care earlier than three quarters of the way in. I also enjoyed the one time we see Cal utterly defeated on Ilum, where the kyber crystal breaks in his hand. Failure is a part of the journey. That lesson felt more than just what was needed to move the narrative forward. It was far deeper than that. As I said, the door to the third tomb rejected him for his guilt. He failed all those years ago, he's deeply internalized that. So this message from Cordova was more than surface level motivation, especially thanks to the presentation. It was a believable development for the character. It becomes clear that this lesson of failure and moving on is the game's theme when even Night Sister Marin learns it. She spent much of her life trying to avenge the slaughtered Night Sisters, but her hatred was built on false pretenses, and as it is with hatred, led her nowhere. In consideration of this, I think it's a very natural thing for her to want to join Cal. She's got to find a real purpose in life. She's got to move on from what's been eating away at her. So when the opportunity to do so stands right in front of her, who wouldn't seize it? That development felt believable, relatable even. It got me interested among other reasons. So sure, while the plot is chasing some generic MacGuffin around the galaxy, there is redemption for this story in the characters. Let's see how it ends. Trilla's got the holocron on Nur, same place she became the second sister, same place Seer was tortured. I knew this place was trouble when I walked in. It's quite clear that there's an element of finality to it. Just about every enemy you can imagine is thrown at you. It's a brutal sequence of combat gauntlets, and that felt very dramatic indeed. Even on Grandmaster, cutting my way through them gave me the impression of finally striking back against the Empire after a full game of playing the mouse. At its end, guess who, surprise surprise, it's Trilla and she is, guess what, a lightsaber boss. She's got a bunch of lightsaber attacks and they're all real cool. It's a strong fight, just like the rest of them. Remarkably unremarkable. She's also got two key problems. Firstly, there's an AoE attack, which can be insanely hard to react to if she does it up close. Typically, Trilla will dodge away and initiate the attack from quite some distance, giving you a reasonable time to consider the appropriate response. Up close, you can't do that, so at least on your first time, you can call some premium bullshit. I'd say the issue here is that if Trilla gets stuck on the environment and can't make the distance, the attack isn't cancelled. So you end up with a ranged AoE initiated in kissing distance. My second problem is this dickhead droid. A hemorrhoid droid. This straight up shouldn't have been in the fight, because you aren't fighting it, you're fighting the lock-on system. It's as irritating as it gets to die because your lock-on was horny and wouldn't get off Trilla. I felt in this fight more than most that the better experience would be on a lower difficulty, where moments like this don't always end in an intense lightsaber pegging session. But I've said everything I've got about souls. We're at the end now. Trilla was the final boss, but she isn't the final encounter. The big D comes out like, what's up? They handle this very intelligently. It's not a fight, it's an escape sequence. Darth Vader's force power tears the terrain to shreds as you scramble away. He's out of sight when you throw yourself in the elevator, building the anticipation, and then he's right back on you. It takes the efforts of the whole team just to make it out alive. Introducing a little horror element to Darth Vader is the least by the numbers element of this entire game, and it was glorious. So, we got the holocron. It was supposed to help rebuild the Jedi Order, but due to Marin's questions and the Zepho's predictions, Cal chooses to destroy it. This way, the Empire can never find them, and their destinies will be left to the Force. I'm not seeing a thematic message here, and it also renders the entire story inconsequential. I really didn't like that. Though maybe Cal was right, that doesn't help the story. It's quite a dull note to end things on, in my opinion. Which really serves to back up my point, that the only worthwhile narrative beat this game's got are the people in it. I can only hope for a sequel, as long as Merrin's there, of course. Now, I always make a point of talking about the end game, but I don't think Respawn put a second's thought into it. Perhaps they assumed that the exploration would be enough. And maybe it is for some, but I don't want a poncho. I want to experience what this game does that I can't get anywhere else. A solid, modern, lightsaber combat system. Without interruptions. Dark Souls doesn't have lightsabers, this game does. This game also has an arena, so there's every asset needed for easy access gameplay. I was almost certain they'd let you come back here, but no such luck. 
It's a huge disappointment to me. Would have been an easy gold mine of replayability, and it's not like you can revisit Nur either. What a shame. I went in with the expectation that this game would be just okay, and what I got was quite fantastic. By every measure, apart from plot and bugs, the game is at least good. But I don't have much of a passion for it. They could have called this game single player game, the single player game, and people would have thought it was top tier satire. I lost a lot of love for the game as time went on and I continually felt like it wasn't even doing its borrowed aspects justice. This game is a Souls-like, but it isn't a skill-based gauntlet, and now it can't be either a decent Star Wars story for beginner gamers, or a Jedi power trip. The combat's good, but that's just the point. It does everything that it sets out to do, but not with the soul, or even the efficacy that made it work so well originally. The puzzles are like Zelda and Darksiders, but not really as good because of inconsistencies and contrivances. The navigation is like Uncharted, but not really as good because it's janky and miles less believable. These slides, like boss runs, they just don't fit. They make no sense. I enjoyed them, but they stuck out like a sane person on Twitter. I found it very hard to love this game, and I still don't love it. But by no means do I think it's bad, overrated, or even meaningless. Proving to publishers that single player games do in fact sell is something I'm very grateful for. It's not a masterpiece, but it's a triumph for the industry, and even for Star Wars. Finally, the franchise is on an upturn. Between The Mandalorian and this, fans are off Suicide Watch. Speaking of suicide, and watching, have you ever wanted to experience Death Stranding without having to play it? Well, now you can't, but you can get pretty close with my 7 hour Death Stranding commentary. I did put a considerable amount of effort into that one, so if you're curious, I think you might enjoy what you see. Be there or be square. Speaking of being square, Squarespace. I finally gave web design a go, guys. Squarespace reached out to me, so I thought I'd seize the moment. And it was a relatively short moment. I managed to pull everything off remarkably quickly. Scheduled posts is a feature from Patreon I was glad to see here. Community features provides my very own commenting, liking, and replying system, but best of all, appointment scheduling. Maybe you guys know someone who takes clients, an artist for example, or a teacher, I sure do. And like I said last year, I've been considering joining them, a small step into voice work. But boy, was I not looking forward to coding that in some other web designer. With Squarespace, I eventually opted for the flexible contact us feature, and it took me about half an hour. I had checkboxes, all all the fields ready, it was connected to my email, I didn't have to look up a single wikiHow tutorial. Squarespace is a highly functional, amazingly accessible blend between a website style and substance. The good news is they're offering you something too. If you head on down to squarespace.com slash whitelight you can get 10% off whatever you buy first with the code whitelight. For the first time in history, you can be there and be square. I'll see you guys later. Thank you to L. Hudson, Dominic Jaworski, Fabian Flack, Benjamin Carter, Rosa, Bishop Nelson, John Lemley, Ballistic Rainbow, Mr. T with some T, Mardi, Lex Williams, Meme, Gurneil Kang, Roman 32374656, Sim, Joshua Carolan, Douglas Griffith, Abby, Leon Cartendahl, Noah B. Satterley, Holy Shift, Juris Purins, Combat Wombat, Chance Tucker, Quarter Gamer, Captain Excellence, Trixie Lullamoon, Sleepy Bear, Sai, Drop ZZ, Shade, The Loot. Meister and Rob Massey.